All right, welcome back to part two of our conversation on the PPB Commission's report. Uh, so Jen, we talked a lot in the first part of the conversation about what the Pentagon can do for itself and how there's a lot of myths out there about what's in law and what's not. But legitimately, Congress has a big role in creating the system that we all apparently are unhappy with today um, because they share it. So what are some of the things that we thought about, looked at in terms of the role of Congress in all of these reforms? Yeah, so one of the things um, we talked about, and really one of the reasons I joined the commission and accepted to be on it was how do we strengthen our relationships, right? Absolutely, how do we make it less confrontational? How do we provide information that's easier to consume and understandable? How do we um, engage? Uh, as you're probably aware, um, when, you're, when the budget rolls over in early February-ish, over from the president to the congressional defense committees, um, it's, it comes over a little, we used the word last time, clunky. It comes over a little clunky. It usually comes over a little bit late, and it usually isn't complete, truthfully. Um, look at what's happening in this fiscal year, right? I appreciate and I applaud the Defense Department submitting its budgets uh, over on Tuesday, but it still doesn't have an appropriations bill. And so as you go read what is called the justification. From last year, it doesn't correct. have an appropriations bill. So you read the justification material, which is the only legally binding information provided between the branches of government. It's going to be inaccurate. And so uh, having been a professional staff member reading all the justification books, it's going to have the fiscal year 24 column for the budget and the information is going to be inaccurate because it won't include the appropriations information. Um, and so it's, 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 um, uh, it's struggling. And so one of the recommendations. So, so the viewers can actually find some of this stuff, right? So yes, when absolutely. we're recording, the budget has just been released. Yes. And by law, the various federal agencies put that stuff up on public websites. Correct. And so you can go find your way to the DOD's Comptroller website. Yes. And the services websites, which yes. are linked from there. Yes. And find pages and pages, thousands. hundreds and thousands of pages. I was say hundreds of thousands. Of, of yes. description of what yes. your tax dollars are going to be doing Correct. in theory in yes. fiscal year 25. Correct. And I guess you're pointing out, we've been pointing out, to build something that immense takes a long time. It does. It necessarily has to have this bureaucratic structure and process, none of which can move at the speed of technology. Yeah. To compound all of those problems, it's helpful to know how much money you have in order to build your future budgets. Right. And there is a little bit of confusion because we're, we've never actually finished last year's PPB process because the appropriation is yet to be finished, right? right? So. Um, so some of that is Congress's fault, um, and yeah. some of that is the executive branch fault. So yes. what are some of the things that we can, and, we and, can be and, and truthfully, Arun, it's not a blame game at this point in time. It's a team. And if it's not looked at as a team and building those relationships, it gets, it continuously gets to, no, you made a mistake. No, you made a mistake. No, 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 no. We're all making mistakes. That is the fact. Um, and so how do we improve those? Well, one of the recommendations is to improve the communication, right? In our mid-year... Um, so much of the system is built on trust and relationships. Uh, relationships, absolutely. <clears throat> Communicating multiple times, not just at the d identified touch points. So the budget comes over in February. Shortly thereafter, there's what's called Stafford A briefs, right? So actually, and there's hearings going on at the same time. So all these are happening over the mar months of March, April and May. You have congressional hearings, you have engagements between the professional staff members on the committees and the um, executive branch and industry. All three happen at the same time, all within about a 90 day period. And so we're saying those are great, although we would say we should probably uh, look at the ju justification books, right? The justification books, if you look at them, um, they're, they're, um, the justification books are the actual books that describe the budget request. Yes. Okay. Legally, mm -hmm. right? Justify how you're going to spend two dollars. And so we re we recommended some changes on how those are built. Correct. Is that right? Restructure them, review them. Go ahead. No, we we recommend a working group between DoD and Congress. There's a lot of difference of opinion on what should be in them, but they're not consistent mm -hmm. in in between the colors of money. They're not consistent across the services on the level of detail and what the content is. So um, they need to be improved. And I, we've talked a lot about emerging technology. The O&M part of the bu budget is like 35% of the 900 billion, nearly $900 billion appropriation. You can't really tell what the department's doing 
by looking at the J books. It only okay. talks to increase, decrease statements. It's not programmatic. So if I'm a small business or a technology company, I can't look at that and figure out where I might fit when we definitely need them to help with some of our diminishing manufacturing issues. It's just not there, not clear. So you then in your former life on the Hill, me yep. and my former life yep. on the Hill, we're absorbing the formal budget request online and in those justification books. And they used to sit in piles, right? Yep. In the old days yep, the green on our books. desks. And mm -hmm. um, simultaneously, we're having these hearings. Okay. We're having these staffer day meetings, basically, between the Pentagon officials and the, and the congressional staff. Okay. Here's what we want in our budget request. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, we've got these other voices in our head, right? The, there's these things called unfunded requirements lists okay. that are being delivered by the Pentagon okay. to the Congress, which basically are saying, here's other things we would like if more money becomes available because we didn't get them into what you guys are considering as our budget request. There's other people visiting the Hill also. Absolutely. Industry and yep. universities and even sometimes people in government saying- GAO, dot and &E. Telling us things yes. like these things might deserve more money. Some of them turn into what we call earmarks, right? In, in For companies or for states. And some people are telling us these things deserve less money. The program isn't working as well. And so- uh, as, as the budget says it is. And so um, I guess what you're saying is that to help the Congress absorb all of that information, <clears throat> we need to improve the quality of that information Correct. and the way it's delivered. Correct. And multiple touch points of communication. <clears throat> Dropping off pieces of paper, lots of PDFs is one step of the process. But then the second part of it is, wouldn't it be great if it came in a data framework that people could consume, right? So one of our recommendations is to have unclassified and classified data repository for all the information exchange. Now that's the physical- Between the two branches. Correct, physical information exchange, right? The J books will come over in, in, in that format. The selected acquisition reports, all the other documentation that comes out of the Which describe the way acquisition programs are Absolutely. running. Right? All of that would come in. So then you'd have, I mean, wouldn't it be great, a searchable database that both are looking at and using and sharing information. Then you really start to establish the relationship, right? But then the next thing we suggested is more improved in-person communication, right? So we said, we called it a mid-year update in our midterm report, remember back in in, um, in August. August. Then we got some feedback saying, what do you mean by mid-year? And we didn't mean mid fiscal year, mid appropriation year. It's more of you have the congressional defense committees do their markup and then there's a pause and then they start conference. In between that pause is probably when they should re-engage. Did new threat emerge? Did, were there new threats? Emergent technologies that came up, are there new threats? There should be another formal engagement before conference happens. So for the, there's a lot of NDIA members who are government employees and trained and both of us were executive branch employees as well. Correct. You're trained to say, I support the president's mm -hmm. budget. Um, and there's two interesting things about that. One is it's actually a budget request okay. and not a budget. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is I really don't support the president's budget because I know in my head, because I'm an expert in this area, that technology has changed and threat has changed. And I know in the two year process of building this budget, those things have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And so how do I, but I still have to go and say, I support the president's budget. And so I guess this is trying to address a little bit of that issue of how we can help the Pentagon describe to Congress that even though this is what the budget request said, here are some fact of life changes that you might want to consider. Did I get that right? Yeah, I, I guess it depends on what you need to talk about because there's a lot happening in your year of execution that DOD needs help with that's not the budget request, I'm executing what's been enacted. And so maybe I got a lot of fuel money because of the fuel price increase and then all of a sudden I can't spend it all. Be a good idea if I had a conversation with my congressional staff and say, hey, I might, I might not be able to spend it all and maybe you're gonna see a reprogramming. So that before the reprogramming shows up on your yeah. desk, you're aware that this is already an issue, right? So that's not really an issue with the president's budget. But other things change, like we've talked about, technology changes so quickly. By the time the justification books show up in a PDF, things have probably already changed on my program and I need to let you know, hey, this is now stale data and I could use your help here. 
right? So, but sometimes it's just shifting colors of money, which I think we've dealt with together in yeah. the past yeah. as well. So I, I don't think that's really out of bed. It's still, you're talking about the same programmatic content, it's just a shift in the budget structure. A yeah, little. and you said the unfunded priority list, right? So make that clear too, right? The budget comes over, which it came over from the executive branch to the legislative branch on Tuesday of this week, right? Just a couple days ago. Um, within 10 days, the secretaries, no, the chiefs of the services will send over their unfunded priority lists, which means, all right, I didn't have, at, during the programming phase, the second P of the PPBE, they said, here's other things if I had $5 more I would spend on. They take that list, they clean it up, and they send it over to the Hill. So they're, they're already recognizing as soon as they submitted the document, they need changes, the executive branch does, to the legislative branch. And so what happens, now the appropriators, which I used to have to do, was prioritize. All right, so they're saying I need both buckets of money. The Army says I need all of this for these weapon systems, but if I had five more dollars, I would spend it on these other areas. I felt like it was important for me to figure out where, where should we reinvest based off of their priorities because their unfunded priorities are usually really current issues. And because so, they can be built more quickly. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. And you get it from the COCOMs too, yes, right? Yeah. Well, the so, COCOMs. So Indo-PACOM is sending yes. theirs and, and, and AFRICOM and UCOM yes. are kind of busy these days. They're sending theirs. Yes. And so I guess in your mind that these appear to be higher priorities, at least more urgent. Priorities. Yes. And so then you have to go and as an appropriate, go find money to fix the problems that were just identified 10 days after the budget. And so I guess this received. is where some of the lack of trust comes in, then, right? Is that in the end, it's basically a zero sum game. And the appropriations committees and the staff and the members to pay for some of these urgent things that they're hearing about, in addition to paying for some of the things that their constituents are asking right. for, right? Correct. Those earmarks for companies, for universities, for government laboratories, whatever, uh, or for good new ideas, right? Um, the money has to come from somewhere. Yes. And so that results in cuts. Yes. And the cuts, I think, are what gives the executive branch a feeling of, if I share too much, I'm exposing myself to potentially to cuts, right? Mm -hmm. So how do I think about that whole, that whole dynamic? Sorry to interrupt you, but there are no longer earmarks. Earmarks went away in 2011 or 2012. There are congressional interest items, right, in the appropriations bill for areas where there's ads. It quacks like a duck. There are no <laughs> earmarks, says the appropriator in the room. Um, there are no earmarks. And there really aren't, because you notice when you read the front of the appropriations bill, it says all these congressional ads have to be competed. It's in like the third paragraph and of that the report. That would make a great podcast. And the FAR tells you you have to as well. Right, and so, so there are no earmarks. Um, but there are. So if the, the executive branch asks for, I need five more cups, I already have 10 and I need five more, and that was on their unfunded priority list, is that an earmark? Or is that this, the executive branch saying, oh, we've identified a threat and we don't, 10 cups doesn't solve the problem, we need 15, right? And so, and that all happens all within about 90 days. And I just wanna highlight here to you guys as well, with a very small team, right? And so, um, you're, right, the PPBE process takes up what, thousands of people to build the budget? Absolutely. Thousands yeah. and thousands. The Appropriations Committee will have 12 people on it to review what people spent thousands of people to work on, right? On the Authorizations Committee, you have 50-ish people right? Um, on the SASC, right? And SACD is we just compare the two of them, right? These are small teams trying to review everything in a very short amount of time. So what did I just say? The information comes over late and it's usually bad. And so, which is why we need to modernize our data systems. We need to modernize our systems that we exchange information to build that relationship back up. And, you know, even though there's arguably thousands of people working on these processes uh, in the executive branch. Um, we were just talking about the fact that, the, you know, money gets spent over multiple years. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that these people are working on is managing previous years appropriations. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And the, the process never stops. So some of these people are working on building future budget mm -hmm. requests. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, having been a Hill staffer, uh, 
Congress is constantly asking for information mm -hmm. through these antiquated processes. Mm -hmm. And so I think we talk a little bit about all of that burden on the workforce. And so I, or in addition to sort of these IT connections and this better communications, what, what, are, what are some of the other things that we could do to relieve the pressure on the workforce? So one of our one of our key recommendations relative to this is creating a common analytics platform within the DoD itself. Mm -hmm. So this is not a one system to rule them all, but a systems of systems where you're having authoritative data pulled. Um, so you're seeing not just obligations and expenditures, programmatic data, um, readiness information, so that you can make better decisions at speed. What's actually happening? What's in the actually real world. happening? Yeah. And sharing that internally to the department, and then sharing what's appropriate with Congress. Right. Right. So, and right now, that's it's improving within DoD, but it's nowhere where the private sector is with the modern COTS tools that they're using. Right. Right. Yeah. So right now, we've hamstrung our workforce. I mean, you're going to go into a lot of shops and still see 2,000, you know, row and, and column spreadsheets being used for what should be in a database that moves with AI enabled functions. Right. And in the same way, I guess, almost 50 years ago, the department adopted what was then commercial state of the art management practice and creating this very system. Yes. I guess we're saying maybe it's time to start thinking about adopting more commercial state of the It's high time. It's high time. <laughs> yeah, having an enterprise resource planning system in the Defense Department, that would be unique. Right. And having in that programming process, so the Army's programming process, the Air Forces, the Navy's, the Space Forces, all communicating across each other um, would be fantastic. So now how does this help then the uh, high tech emerging companies, right? Will they get to see some of this information? How will it how will it improve their ability to work with the Pentagon? Well, I think we're still gonna have to post publicly available information, right? We're still gonna have to hang things on the website. So I think it's gonna make those products a higher quality. Yep. I at, at the present time I can't think of letting the private sector into a database. Maybe that's, you know long after I've retired. Okay. So we got a crawl, walk, run. But I think that the justification books will be a better tool. And some of the rollout briefs that roll things up at a higher level, they'll be better products based on these improvements. I don't know, Jen, what do you think? No, I just think the same thing. Yeah. I think is if it's internal, um, inside the executive branches, they're doing their planning and programming budgeting process, they're not going to share that with industry. Do they get industry inputs? Absolutely, right? As they build their palm and they want to build, I keep using the cup, just to be funny, but as they're building the cup, they're having industry say, here's how much the cup costs, here's how long it's gonna take. And so there are ways to influence it, but that internal sausage making, we we probably wouldn't want it, we don't share it across the services, we probably wouldn't share it externally. But as this common, uh, on this enclave uh, shared between the executive branch and legislative branch, I think that will be um, uh, game changing for industry to see. So some of the other recommendations got into actual comptroller and cost mm -hmm. analysis workforces that that work in the Pentagon now. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that we we recommended to uh, to help them out? Well, there's there's an issue right now in the in the Pentagon in particular with recruiting and retention for the programmers and budgeteers, and we're seeing um, you know their their below authorization levels, 12 to 18 percent. So we're telling them focus on recruiting and retention, maybe look at incentives. So they're not even those... hiring the number of people that they were allowed to hire. Right. Uh, because they can't find them? Because because the hiring practices uh, take six plus months, sometimes 12 months to bring people on board. It's difficult to compete for pay. So looking at recruiting incentives, but also the work is difficult. The hours are long. And so what are you doing to streamline the workload? So we go back to data analytics yeah. again. What are, are you gonna use contractors in a different way to help strengthen that workforce? Um, but another key to that is training. I mean, all the time training. So if you imagine a workforce that's stressed, the budget cycle now, there's no break anymore. It's constant, constant fires that you're putting out. They don't have time for training. Um, they don't have time to take leave. So folks are just burning out. And so something has to give so people can have a little bit better balance and, and have time to really understand the modern tools and techniques available. And so I'm curious, we talked a little bit about the congressional side of this and how small the congressional staffs are to absorb the same amount of information. Mm -hmm. um, what, if you had to think about, is there improvements that could be made on the congressional side on the workforce side, beyond the data sharing, is what, what would that be? Well, that's a hard question, Arun, right? 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm fortunate I spent five years in SACD and I loved every minute of it. Um, it's the best joint job. I learned a lot about the Defense Department, but it was um, a lot of hours and a lot of work. And so, I mean, there'd be similar kinds of things, right? And so training for the staff on the commission or on the committees would be great too, right? Similar training that the executive branch has, um, probably expanding the staff, right? I mean, between the authorization and appropriations committees, um, there's definitely a difference in the staff size, right? Um, with the same, a similar responsibility. And so adding more staff on the appropriation side would probably be really helpful. Again, giving them data that's digitally consuming instead of building their own spreadsheets to evaluate things, right? Making it easier for them to do their jobs. And then um, uh, back to that communication. Right. The more they get uh, the, not just the I support the president's budget pitch, but really what actually is going on, they could be a better teammate, right? I mean, they're already great teammates, but the, the information that comes over, right? I said it and I'll say it again, is, is usually late and it's bad and it's minimalist, right? If you actually built the relationship, you would expand the problem set and provide that information. So helping the staff do that, their job, absolutely. Yeah, and the other thing I realized is it's amazing how few people have done what you did and lived on both sides of the river. Yep. And sort of understand, yep. lived, lived amongst the apes on either side, wherever the apes live, <laughs> and understand how they operate. Yeah. And so then you can, you can communicate, and, and maybe encouraging more of that flow back and forth might be a useful thing. Yeah, I was honored to have that opportunity. And, and I'll tell you, this is a little story there just for a second. When I left the executive branch and went to the legislative branch, two of the, my three mentors said, no. <laughs> because it's the enemy. And and these were senior government officials. And I was like, no, no, no. It's about the relationship. And so, yes, I was I'm honored to have that. As well as spending time in industry. Because if industry isn't a part of this, if we don't have emergent tech, if the innovation isn't in there, the national security ecosystem falls apart. Right. So the industry piece is important. Just uh, That made me think that when I used to give talks as a congressional staffer to executive branch audiences, I would feel like I had to convince them that I was part of the government. And I used to say, I have a Furs account and a Blackberry. If that doesn't qualify <laughs> me, you know, what else is there? But we joke it's an unnatural act, it right? To have that engagement. Act, right? It is. So, okay, there's an elephant in the room, which is <laughs> the fact that while we are talking, we actually don't have a fiscal year 24 appropriation. Mm -hmm. um, and that means we're in a thing called a continuing resolution. Yes. And so what do we think, what did we talk about with respect to continuing resolutions, which are become pretty much a fact of life in the last few years? Yes. So, well, we debated this heavily um, as a commission on whether we should make any recommendations to mitigate the adverse effects of CRs. Would it make CRs more likely? Well, I think... Could they be any more likely than they are? They are, they are almost inevitable. <laughs> inevitable. In fact, so likely that pretty much from an execution and acquisition standpoint, we're, we're pretty much trained not to ever let a new contract in the first quarter because we're assuming there will always be a CR. Um, we also talked about the fact that the CRs are caused by things outside of the DOD-Congress relationship. It's other factors. Um, not Larger political debates. Political issues, Yeah. So, so then we made a couple recommendations to get after this because it's harming, it's harming, you know, we're, the industry. It's cash flow issues for small businesses, and we, and we're, it's harming our ability to deliver capability at speed. So, um, one of them is to allow some minimal amount of new starts during a continuing resolution. Because one of the rules in a continuing resolution, which you tell me if that's law, regulation, or urban legend, law. is that you can't do. No can't starts. create a new program Law. that so, so that's a legal restriction. It, they put it in the continuing resolution itself. And so, so we're saying provide some relief in that because you may want to start the new drone project or something like that. Right. Okay. Or, or you might need a production quantity increase, but during a CR, you're only supposed to stay at last year's level. So allowing those to continue if the four committees and subcommittees passed a bill, their bill and they support it. Right, you're still going to be limited by the top line, so you'll have to prioritize by the CR, CR cash you're given. But to allow for those important efforts to move forward, I, I mean, I think I heard uh, Dr. Deplant refer to this as taking running a race and taking a knee every quarter mile. <laughs> That's basically what's been happening, you know, year over year. Yeah, and Laura said it really, really well. Um, if all four congressional committee defense committees, so that's SASC, HASC, 
Hackney and Sackby, all four individual bills say to start the CUP program, and no one puts in any derogatory language in their individual bills, we're saying during the CR, it should be allowed to be started. No one has put any objections in, and so the CUP should be able to be started. That's one of the recommendations because every bill has already spoken its piece, right? And, and the conferences of those haven't been approved yet. And so that is, I think that would be uh, game changing. And I don't, in my opinion, I don't think that would be limiting the control of a CR in its own state because everyone had spoken their piece. The same thing for quantities. Mm -hmm. So if all four, Hask, Sask, Hackdy, Sackdy, have said you can buy five cups instead of uh, three, which you bought last year, we're saying you should be able to buy five cups during the CR too. Those and, are two great examples. And it's a return to what it used to be in the early 2000s with mm -hmm. the lesser of the house and Senate that we used to have. It mm -hmm. gives the markup a lot more weight. It does. Yeah. So it's listening to the Congress during the CR. Yeah. And I guess arguably the increased communication at least would get you more of those things into those marks. Absolutely. In case there's a CR. Absolutely. And so, okay. But... There's no magic button to push to say CR shall no longer be a thing. No, there's only way, two ways for the, the executive branch to continue to exist is budget authority and continuing resolution. So without a budget authority approval or continuing resolution, there's a shutdown. Right. And so we would not want the third. My last question on CRs is, the, um, again, back to the myth busting. It was never quite clear what the actual rules to operate were when you're under a CR. There's two that were very clear and we talked about them, the no new starts and don't increase the numbers of things you're gonna produce. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, it seems to be a lot of interpretation and different things going on. A lot in of misinterpretation. Places. So what are some things that actually are sort of urban myths uh, in the CR world? A, a lot of folks are overly conservative and think you can only basically keep the lights on. Right. So they drop down to almost no operations when you're really supposed to be maintaining where you ended last year, just the day before running at the same speed. Yes. yes. Not taking a knee. No. Correct. No. Yeah. And I'll tell you, when I was in finance in the Pentagon, I love the CR. I know that's the opposite of what most people would say because it was a blank appropriation. Right. But it's each, cash. Yes, yeah. it was cash. So so R&D Army, R&D Air Force gets a budget. That R&D Air Force budget decides, does program one get $2, program two get $3, program four? So you have truly more flexibility than you do under a budget. And I know that's the opposite, and I, so I see your eyes Jen rolling Jen Santos, me. the financier yep. in the Pentagon, would have agreed with that. How much flexibility I mean, did we have during a CR? It's okay, true. within the controls of those budgets, right, for the CUP program, each one of them, but there's definitely... Um, abilities to be able to move it. But each service, financial world, has different controls. You're perfectly spot on. Folks will say, we can do barely minimum because we never know if we're going to get another dollar. Right. So they hold And they it. sit like, on the money. Yes. Instead of other services, like take it all and come back and ask for more. I wonder what Jen Santos, the appropriator, would have thought of all of that. Oh, gosh. Well, you know, you get to learn every job you go into. Right. Okay. And so and I always say this every job I went into, I wish I knew that information when I was in a job before. Right. Um, but under a CR, um, there is some ability, but it does. It, it just makes it harder to operate. Right. No, no. You know, well, especially if you're getting your money every two weeks, like yes. little dribs and drabs. Yes. Just right. think about, you know, so a lot of my time in the program office, mm -hmm. how many funding documents am I gonna have to cut? Yes. How many contracting yes. actions is the contracting yes. officer writing? Like you've upped everyone's workload. Yes. Right. right. And they're so also- So it's worse than taking it. You're almost going yes. backwards to yeah. In a way, yes. yes. Yeah, and my positive comment was on distribution, not on all the actions right. that happen right. following yeah. on, absolutely. Yeah. So no one so endorsing the CR, no. But, no. but there is some myth busting that can be there done is. within the CR. Yes. Well, you can also work on the new efforts that are not approved yet. You can get everything done short of awarding a contract, but a lot of folks won't do anything until they have a funding document in hand. But you can do everything up yes, short of that. Right. So it then drives the me money crazy drops and you can execute it. immediately. All right. So the the report is great. A lot of a lot of uh, things on how to move faster. A lot of things on how to find the myths and 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 uh, dismiss them. Communication with Congress. Better IT systems. X hundred pages of great stuff. So what's <laughs> happening now? Well, we're doing a lot of outreach to build the momentum and the appetite for change, right? Because change is difficult. It's not a natural thing that humans, most humans want to do. So we're 
trying to convince folks in the DOD and folks in Congress that they should execute some of these changes. I, I think, I don't think any of us is, thinks that all 28 will get implemented, yeah. but I think a, a lot of key ones will. And, and the reception so far has been? It's been very positive. On both the congressional and the executive? On both side? sides, yes. Um, I've been surprised no one's called us crazy yet. <laughs> <laughs> I keep waiting for that other shoe to drop. But the Deputy Secretary of Defense is really leaning into this. She's already issued uh, implementation guidance for the interim report yep. recommendations. And, and they're moving the out. the same day our report came out publicly. It did, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really encouraged. But we also recommend an implementation team mm -hmm. for the DOD to establish one and take people out of the day-to-day -day business to focus on the recommendations they Actually want to implement. Actually putting some of these ideas into effect. Yes. Um, so uh, the industry members of NDIA can find the report online. Yes. Uh, do you know the URL? Um, PVPE.senate.gov. Okay, and we'll paste yes. that on into the into the into the uh, into the video. Um, what else can industry or university? We need your do? help. We need your help, industry. We need yeah. your help, industry. Can I say that again? We need your help. Why do we need your help? If you think these are of value to you that allows you to bring in information technology quicker to the national security ecosystem, your voice matters. Absolutely, right? The executive branch and legislative branch, they're busy. They're working their prog prog processes, the PPPE by itself. But if you say in industry, collectively, you know, recommendation three, eight, 13, and 15 are really help industry move the needle faster, and you say that publicly, I think it could encourage the executive branch and legislative branch to, um, to consume those recommendations. And so I think that's a really key point from for NDIA listeners. Jen gets the last word. With that, we're gonna we're gonna close. I want to thank Lara and Jen for joining me today and talking us through the PPBE uh, Commission's report. Uh, just to let you all know, uh, the Emerging Technologies Institute here at NDIA continues to have its drumbeat of great activities. Uh, most importantly. The second annual NDIA Emerging Technologies Conference is going to be held August 7th through 9th at the Walter E. Washington, D.C. Convention Center. Uh, visit our website for more information. Also visit our website and the NDIA website to sign up for our mailing list and register for our various webinars, events, and educational offerings, including our monthly Tech 101 series. Um, if you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with all of our content. Special thank you to Melanie Yu and Daniel Park for producing the, the podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in to Emerging Tech Horizons.